Okay, so we we supposed to like Bitcoin now? What the fuck? <laughs> I mean, so, I've liked Bitcoin for a long time, <laughs> but yes, you should. <laughs> I've never liked Bitcoin. I, I've Why always not? like for the past three years, my mantra yeah. was my, my mantra was I don't understand Bitcoin. It's not my investment, but but unlike all of these other coins, which I know nothing about, one thing I know about Bitcoin, and I've said it since 2020, is it has so much Wall Street money in it, it just it just it can fail at that point where there's so much sharks involved in this, it just uh, it's it's gonna do well. But except other than that, I don't know anything about Bitcoin, bro. Educate me, teach me. Yeah, I can do that. I don't know how deep down the rabbit hole we want to go, but I'll try and keep it high level. So there's there's two books that I read that kind of really changed my view on Bitcoin, and it, it allowed me to understand how money works a lot better and stores of value. Like, have you ever owned gold? Never. At all? No, yeah, it's unproductive. It kind of sucks. The only time, you, never, the only time it comes in helpful is like after the peak in 2008, and then after everything collapsed, people moved to gold because it's scarce. And, and then they did really good off of gold for a while, like nine, 12 months. And then they and then they started moving back into stocks again. So like it's a way when shit hits the fan, um, scarce assets are helpful because. Let me just back up. So two of my favorite books. Let me get back to my point here. The Bitcoin Standard by Safedine and then another one called Broken Money by Len Alden. These are two like economists, people that have spent a lot of time learning what money is. And there's two things that you need for good money or a good store of value. It's liquidity. And then you want, it, it needs to be scarce. It needs to be able to hold its value. It needs to be divisible. I guess that's a lot more than two things. It needs to be transportable. It needs to be something that people aren't going to get tired of years from now or be able to fabricate or replicate like the dollar. The dollar yeah. right now, that's, that's one I love to trash on. So I love I love the USA. Um, I don't think we're going to lose our world reserve currency status. Yeah, they should. Um, I don't think we're going to lose our status anytime soon. Have you been watching uh, my videos back in the day when it yeah. was fashionable to say that the the dollar is is going to zero and like I was oh making videos God, saying so this is a bunch of horse horse shit. And yeah, yeah, I watched that too, and I thought the same thing I, for a while. There, I was like, ah, maybe, and then I did a bunch of research, and I'm like, there's just there's just no way we have the most powerful military we have the most powerful technology companies we have we have we have the most liquid currency on earth right now and i don't see that changing with bitcoin um anytime soon not that it couldn't someday it might but i don't think it will but i do think that it's an excellent store of value and i think it's because it's got all the things that made gold great um again like the scarcity the fact that it you know it was something that could be used internationally. There was, it was something where everybody said, hey, yeah, no, this makes sense. This is a good thing to use. It's malleable. We can turn it into a coin later on. It's not easily destroyed, um, but you can't just make a bunch of it. It comes with a scarce supply that only so much can be found over the years. Um, and so these things, these things hold value because in a, in a day and an age where just like the last, since the pandemic, uh, 35 to 40 percent of the money that's ever existed in our country's history was created. And I don't like to get political. It came from both parties. Both of them are really good at printing money. And I think going yep. forward, we're just at a point where they can't stop. We've got too many expenses. We're getting to the point to where it's like before the military was the biggest part of the budget and everybody complained about that. Um, the interest will be the biggest part of the budget. So people have a new thing to complain about. So like when you're in a world where things can't hold value and that if you keep your money and just hold on to it, it melts. People look for things that help save that and that maybe even turn it into a multiplier and allow them to be wealthier. And so I think that uh, I think that's the real root of Bitcoin. That's what's made it so popular. And it's the distrust too. And, and we're just in a chaotic world. We're in a world where you know, we could be at war with China in a couple of years. Who knows? Their choice. We're in, a, we're in a world where, you know, Israel is fighting half of the Arab nations. We're in a world where Russia's fighting Ukraine. We're in a world where our media and Azerbaijan are talking about going to war here soon. There's just a lot of conflict. 
a lot of this, I believe, is derived from issues with money and countries wanting power and wanting expansion or, you know, just fighting with each other. But the thing is, if if the world does break out into a broader conflict, like a world war, that's where it's like, OK, countries are going to be split down the middle. Are they going to use the dollar? They're going to use the Chinese yuan? Probably not. They're going to want something to be able to trade in between each other. And so, like, I could go all over the place. And my mind does usually about Bitcoin and, and just investing in general. But I think it's one of those things where at least for the next six to 12 months, maybe a little bit longer, I think Bitcoin is a great hedge against chaos. Even Larry Fink, mm. the largest, the CEO of BlackRock, the fund that owns like yeah. has like ten trillion dollars in AUM assets under management. That guy says that Bitcoin is two gold 2.0 and that it's a hedge against chaos in the world and countries that are devaluing their currencies. And every country is doing it in mass right now at record pace. And when when I go back and look at some of these books like the Bitcoin Standard and like Broken Money from Lynn Alden. It's like a lot of civilizations die from money. They die from it. Rome didn't just have a problem of expansion. They literally printed their money into oblivion and nobody could trust it anymore and they couldn't control it. They couldn't control the regions that they'd accumulated. And I look what's happening in the USA and we're the cleanest shirt and the dirty laundry, in my opinion. We're like the best plays left. And mm -hmm. we printed almost 40% of the money that's ever existed in our history since the pandemic. And it's like people need Bitcoin, whether they realize it or not, they need it. And it's crazy to me right now that anybody wouldn't have at least a three to five percent allocation because that's like that's fuck you money. Who even cares about three to five percent? So but anyway, I've said a lot. What do you got for questions, man? <laughs> so I'm going to try and keep this uh, uh, going the way I did it with Sachin. When we were doing the interview, we also had lag. Yeah, so yeah. It does not allow for us to have like a conversation, which sucks because there's like sure. the three second lag. So what we did is like I wait for him to finish, then I ask the question, which is like a old man podcast. But there's no choice when streamer okay, is being cool, a dude. fucking bitch like this. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Fuck you, Streamyard. <laughs> uh, you, ha I hate it when you have like a SaaS product that starts off so well, and then time goes by, you pay so much money, and then just the product goes to shit, like Zoom and Streamyard and all this crap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get you. I and, anyways, so uh, to stay on point uh, without waffling about the qualities of StreamYard, fuck StreamYard. Uh, so you, you, you obviously, what I would say, like a Bitcoin maxim maximalist, uh, you've done well for yourself in the stock market, yep. and you've you've, you've been uh, quite successful at uh, identifying trends early on. So sure. you think that seventy plus thousand after this. Uh, crazy spike we've seen is not the last of it for the rest of the year right so tell me the trajectory of bitcoin in your opinion uh, for the rest of yeah, the yeah i could i could tell you and show you here real quick let me see if i can remember how to share my screen real quick here all right um one second oh, which one do i want oh this is this is the problem with having like 150 windows open it's finding the right one. Oh, here we go I got how it. many screens you got bro Ah, uh, a lot I use about 50 gig of memory, so it's a lot. Um, all right, so here, so this is uh, this in a nutshell, it, it's, it's TA stuff. I won't bore with all the details. The orange vertical line is when the Bitcoin ETF started. The blue one is when the halving is going to occur. I actually think that we could get to $92,000 in Bitcoin before the halving. Yeah. The halving happens in about 40 days. 40 days. Yeah. yeah, it's like 38 or 9 or I don't even know anymore. There's different clocks for everything because it's it's all math and blocks get chose, but they can the timing can move around. But um, but yeah, so I think That's I think like thirty percent in forty days, based on what you just yeah. said right now. Yeah, and I think we could get to one hundred and fifty by the end of the year. I think we could get to two eighty, two hundred and eighty k is my top for this cycle, in my opinion. But I don't know; it could go beyond that. There is so much with the Bitcoin ETFs that have come out, the nine ETFs in the United States. With the one that that's coming up in Brazil right now, with the ones that are going to be turning up in South Korea, with the ones that are probably going to fire off um, in Hong Kong of all places, I don't know how that's going to work out with people trying to get their money out of China. But but there's like these things are firing up all over the place, 
So you have a generation of like retirees and people that didn't trust it because the SEC didn't condone it. And now they're told by the biggest asset managers on the planet, eight F bombs and seven. Hey, we're going to be able to compete between that, man. You know how I talk. But now we Chris have is one of my favorite of people of all time, by the way. I love Chris. Oh, Chris is a good dude. I actually, I know him pretty well. He's a great guy. By the way, you but, blew Tenner's mind. Tenner's like 50. <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's probably, it might be 40 right now. It's not that bad. But, um, but yeah, so I think, I think this thing could go up a lot. Again, we have, we have the biggest, one of the largest assets. Well, we're talking about a hundred percent. Huh? You're basically saying 30% in 40 days and a hundred percent in nine months, eight and a half months. It could be more. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, Ooh. it's this next div right here. So, but I think, I think that's very doable. Honestly, we've already done that. And so and I don't want people to misinterpret what you're saying, because anything we're saying, look, it's Bitcoin. It might as, it, it just as much can go to 17,000 by the end of the year. That's the, no. that's the thing about Bitcoin. I disagree with that. I Where's actually, the floor? So tell me the floor. Tell me the floor. We're probably right now uh, 65. So 65. you think Bitcoin? Wow. That's it. If you're right, if you're if you're right. Yeah, that's a hell of a trade. You're talking about a floor of 65 on, on 72 entry and then. Uh, 150 upside that's a crazy ass trade, yeah. And that's there's a hell crazier of a trade. ones because, like, micro strategy is something that just I saw your prediction up. 11,700. What were you saying? What did you say? You said 11, 11, 7, 11. 11.7 for micro strategy, yeah, yeah. That's I think that... so. Let's talk about it. Hold on, let's talk about it. That's I'm curious about it. So, leave this yep. on the screen because I think it's fascinating. So, uh, this is yep. go ahead. Sorry, so I'm saying. Go ahead. You you finish. We have a lag, guys. So the the thing, the awkwardness, it's lag. It's not me and Jesse. You know. Oh no, no worries, man. You go first. You go first. Ask whatever you want here, and I'll I'll bring it up. So, um, like with micro strategy. So layman asking a Bitcoin expert, right? So, I I look, I I pick winning horses. That's what I do for a living. Okay, I've done well for myself. I don't know. You had a good year. I had a pretty good year, not just in yeah. Palatier and a lot of my picks. I had a pretty good year. You've, you've been following my work. I, yeah. I tend to pick winners. So I think Bitcoin is a winner just for many reasons that I have nothing to do with the fundamental analysis of the technology, the blockchain. I'm just seeing people with a lot of clout and influence and power put their weight on it. And I think it's going to do fine. Now, having said that, which is the only thing I can say about it uh, without uh, you know going outside of my realm of expertise. Sure. This is an interesting question to you. This is something that I, I saw for me. By the way, we have four, 420 viewers. That's the perfect number. Nobody leave, nobody can come in. Bro. <laughs> Better than 69. So, so why, why should I, the layman, instead of buying a pure Bitcoin or an ETF, why should I buy a micro strategy? Tell me. That, that's, I, I know yeah. what you're going to say, but I want to hear your, your theory for the audience. Yeah, so I can explain that pretty easily. Um, so MicroStrategy has a brilliant thesis. And you know what? I could probably bring up some visuals on this real quick too. Let me do this. Bookmarks. I think I got some. While you look for that, I'm going to say for the for good order's sake that uh, Jesse has about a 10x prediction on MicroStrategy from this point on. Give yeah. Or take with you. Yep. I do. And, and so this, this is, it's not my best image. I, I, I need to do my bookmarks better, I guess. But um, so why, here's why I think. Just to kind of give people like an intro, micro strategy, former yeah, yeah, SaaS company that. turned into a Bitcoin ETF pretty much. Yeah. Yeah. So this company, this company is actually run by a guy named Michael Saylor. He is the last remaining tech CEO from the dot-com era, which should tell you something. And he uh, he used to shit talk Bitcoin all the time for years on 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 X, formerly Twitter, and maybe some other social media platforms. And then one day he realized the power behind it, and now he's devoted his entire company to Bitcoin. And uh, and so he he's turned it into an ETF essentially. It has no fees. Um, mm -hmm. And what he does he he buys Bitcoin when his company his stock becomes overvalued. He dilutes shares and buys Bitcoin with it. And then when Bitcoin goes up, his company becomes more valuable. And even just with the purchase, it offsets the, the dilution. 
And then, and then the company's worth more money and then it becomes more overvalued. And the shorts that are, that are in here get squeezed even harder. And then he dilutes the stock again and then he buys more Bitcoin. He just bought 800 million uh, over the weekend. And so he just keeps doing this and he's created a perpetual money printer with this stock and with Bitcoin. And it's all perfectly legal. It's absolutely insane. And that's why I use this image for it, because it looks beautiful. And it's it's almost like, to me, a GameStop moment, because this thing could become very disconnected from even what the Bitcoin holdings are that it has. And people will be OK with that because they know that he can just buy Bitcoin with the difference and then overnight make the company more valuable. Now, I will say this. This will work very well for, for the bull market while it goes up. But since this isn't an ETF where it's connected one to one mm -hmm. with the underlying asset, I would not hold this shit in a bear market for the life of me because there's something called Grayscale uh, GBTC. It was the Grayscale Bitcoin Investment Trust. It was the only yep. real way to get access to Bitcoin before the ETFs. And that became incredibly disconnected from the Bitcoin holdings. And it dropped an extra 50% from what they had. So I will just say this. In a bull market, what he's doing is brilliant. And I think you can get a 2 to 3x multiplier in your returns for Bitcoin while this is going up. And you've got a good year to a year and a half. These mm -hmm. cycles are predictable. They, they happen every four years because of the halving event. Probably should have started there. Um, but because of that, because they reduce the new supply of Bitcoin every four years, and right now in April, it's going to happen again, we'll go from 900 new Bitcoin a day down to 450. Right now, the existing Bitcoin ETFs are consuming Bitcoin new issuance at a rate of 10 to 15 days of new supply. Mm -hmm. And when that halving occurs, if the price hasn't went up, that will be 20 to 30 days of new supply. So one day equals a month, 12 equals a year, 36 equals three years, 48 equals four years. And then in four years, the, the new issuance gets cut in half. So then it's technically even a longer time frame. So Bitcoin is a perpetual money machine right now. It has a use case and a purpose behind it in a world where the macro is frightening and people are looking for some, everybody's looking for places to make money and store money. They have to do this because of the way fiat is and the way of Keynesian economics and just printing money to oblivion. But Bitcoin turns it into a perpetual money printer. Everybody that joins the network just makes that happen more aggressively. And then MicroStrategy is turning itself to a perpetual money printer off of that. So it's a great play. From a safety standpoint, I think for the next year, it's an easy multiplier to Bitcoin's returns and it will make people a ton of money. It will be volatile. Bitcoin miners are an even better way to make money, but they go down hard and they can be disconnected with the price of Bitcoin for a while. I have people like crazy that are like, why are you, why are you in the miners? I'm going to quit. I'm going to move to MicroStrategy. I'm going to go back to Bitcoin mm -hmm. because CleanSpark, for instance, one of these miners, I'll just give you this real quick and then I'll, you can throw out any questions you have. But CleanSpark went up 265% in six weeks, just a few weeks ago. Bitcoin only yeah, went up 50% in that time. And people are like, oh my God, I don't understand. CleanSpark's down 16% today. It's like, guys, you bought the really big rubber band. And when Bitcoin moves, that that fucker really moves. So if you if you if you you're gonna celebrate being up 265% when Bitcoin's only up 50, you better be okay when it drops fucking 50% when Bitcoin's went down 10. And people just don't seem to understand that. But that's an that's another play that where it's an even greater multiplier. I think MicroStrategy could be a two. People to don't three understand. I think in general, retail investors they yeah. tend to not understand beta. No, uh, and uh, the importance of understanding beta is uh, is uh, is kind of overlooked by human tendencies to overvalue upside and underappreciate the risks. Totally. If you have a a three beta stock like Palantir. 
It's going to yeah. rip in good times and it's going to go to the toilet, really to the toilet in, in bad times. And uh, so about micro strategy, so I'm fascinated. By the way, shout out to the 550 people in the chat right now. We keep getting more and more viewers. Um, so, and I'm going to take a question from the audience as well. So okay. basically it sounds to me that what micro strategy does, essentially it's like a, it's like a triple Q of Bitcoin. So yeah. to speak, right? If yep. It's just a leveraged uh, Bitcoin ETF uh, with one difference because it's not constrained to the basically classic structure of an ETF. He can just dollar cost average at all times and yeah. he can uh, dollar cost average into weakness even more so that his cost basis is significantly lower than any other ETF. So if assuming Bitcoin prices will go up, is going to create massive, uh, massive, massive returns for uh, for shareholders. But as you mentioned earlier, the downside of this is uh, you're looking at a leverage play, so it's going to be leveraged on the way down as well. But uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, that's, the beta could uh, kick in, and they could bite you. In although the he has protections, he was on CNBC today and he explained he has some downside protections. He's not completely like uh, uh, playing at the loose, uh, wild and loose. Uh, by the way, he was on CNBC today. Did you see his interview? Did you check it out? I did. Yeah, he's brilliant. Man. Good interview. Like, good interview. Really good. He's he's uh he's going to be seen as a visionary of our times. I think one of them, one of many. Right? We got a lot of good ones. Alex Carp's yeah. great. Elon Musk is amazing. I think Michael Michael Saylor is going to be up in that list when, especially as his company goes potentially, you know, eight x from here this cycle. And he becomes one of the bigger market caps in the industry. It's going to be he wild. He was ridiculed, bro. You remember Jesse when people were making fun of him at seventeen? Oh yeah, yeah. People shitting all over him. But they, yeah. you know, they did that same thing to me. They probably did the same thing to you with Palantir, right? Oh yeah. Like people, people are idiots. They, they're emotional. They chase things when they shouldn't, and then they, they ignore companies that are undervalued. Last year, when I was buying Palantir right near the bottom, and I before I made six hundred k, everybody told me I was an idiot. So it's like, and I made tons of money off of that. And same with Tesla when it was down near that level. All these same things. Same with Tesla now, by the way. People now, oh, Tesla is over. That's it. Tesla is finished. Yeah, I'm I, 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 was, I, I was in the meeting yesterday yeah. with a, the with a automotive executive. And it was like, yeah, the brand is finished. The cars is finished. Yeah, okay. uh, They've ruined the brand, blah, 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 blah. So, and as I looked at him and said, bro, were you born yesterday? <laughs> Yeah, no doubt, <laughs> what are you right? talking about, bro? It's like, no, the Chinese are coming for the next, like, bro. You don't understand how this company operates, you don't understand their fucking DNA. You think you you have to be kidding me, bro? Well, and the it's government isn't going to let them, they're subsidizing these BYDs by like at least 17 to 20 percent. Yeah, they're not going to let them do it. Even Europe isn't letting them do it, they're starting to fight back. So, like, and it's not like the tensions between the United States and China are getting better by the week. It doesn't matter who gets voted into office, they're not going to be good anytime soon. So I don't yeah. even see them as a competitor, not here. But there's also like, a, even if you ignore the China tensions, yeah, there's software superiority and yep. the gap is widening. So unless, uh, look, there, there's an appeal on the, on the cheaper models for sure, for kind of, oh, I just want a cheap EV, fine. But if you're looking sure. for any sort of a kind of a quality product that's a, not premium, but quality, I mean like a, what would be a standard four door sedan, US North American market sedan? I mean, it's, who, he, they, they're accumulating so much miles, so much data. So their their software is eons ahead of the, the Chinese. Not to mention, like, think about it. Like, if you look at Tesla, again, people make this mistake, right? They, they look at Tesla, oh, Tesla is down, the stock is down. And then all the, all the negative theories come out. It's like, yeah. guys, they're working on a humanoid robot. There's going to be a, a, an 85 million employee shortage by 2033 sure. of, of jobs that nobody wants to do that are low paid, high risk, high high uh, erosion jobs, uh, cleaning, security, waste disposal, retail, food production, low pay, uh, jobs that nobody wants to do. Demographics is going to the toilet. Uh, and employer costs on these things are like seventy thousand dollars a year on the forty-five, fifty thousand dollar employee. These employees yeah, get horny, totally. get sick, uh, they absenteeism, everything. they cheat, they lie, they steal, plans, they quit. Everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They yeah. go to vacation. This motherfucker comes in. It costs you. Let's say you pay Tesla twenty-five thousand dollar a year at least on this fucking robot. 
Yeah. Robo doesn't get horny, doesn't get sick. He shows up every day. He does the job, and, and that's it. That's in, and you solve the problem. Is so. Assuming Elon does not fuck up the the delivery, right? If he if he can deliver a product that works as promised, yep. which he has never yep. failed to do to date, right? Uh, assuming he can deliver the product, which I I'm confident of his ability to do so. This is a. Are we really talking about cars, bro? This is like a, no. It's totally. It's some of the, the next industrial revolution. AI out there. It's gonna be amazing. Yeah. So you loading up with like, Tesla? Like you I, I, I've been loading up. Yeah, yeah, me too. And like you were saying, it, he created a, a person printer. I mean, that's what he's doing, right? Like, and the yeah. car is just the base layer of the operating system for the robot. And he and they're like with version twelve. I can't wait for my Tesla to get access to version 12. It's like, I don't remember if it's 93 or 95% of the code that's been deleted, but it's like this thing for the first time isn't a bunch of if then statements and programming. It's like, hey, whoa, what am I? What am I? Oh, okay, I can do these things. Looks like I'm here. All right, what, is, what do they want me to do? They probably want me to back up, let's do that. And then, and then it's looking around at its world and trying to figure out what, where to go next. And like, is this, is this dangerous? And you know, should I turn here? There's this obstacle in my way. Can I get around? It's literally starting to think for the first time ever. And then this guy's building robots that are going to do this. He's got a massive energy business that's that's going to be, I think, huge no matter what happens with FSD and autonomy yeah. and robotic. It's like that they're, they're going to be one of the biggest companies in the world. I actually, I look at it this way. We're, we're at a time in history where we're either going to destroy ourselves with nuclear weapons or... We're on the precipice of abundance because we can print people. We can we can make it to where governments can't steal our, our value anymore through things like Bitcoin. And then we can have the ability to have like energy is probably going to be coming down by 90 percent over the next 10 to 20 years in cost. So when you think about like the base cost of energy alone is such a huge amount of why we pay prices for goods. When at every point of the cycle of creation and distribution, you lower the price of energy by like an exponential amount, that alone will make things cheaper. Bitcoin can make it to where we're all a lot richer and we don't have to worry about our money getting stolen away and realizing, you know, we're 50, 60 years old and we haven't invested, bought a house or bought stocks and everybody yep. that has is rich and we got jack shit because we didn't like it fixes that problem. And then we got have robots that can do all the work for us. We just got to make sure they're not going to kill us. Like that's it. Put a red button on the back. <laughs> but um... yeah, man, <laughs> I, that's 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 like uh, Elon. Elon has been talking about it. That's uh, but who would you entrust the responsibility and anybody else but Elon? Right? Who who would you give the responsibility to? I only mean, I couldn't Elon. think of anybody more. Suitable. Maybe Satoshi yeah, Nakamoto, only. but I think he's dead. I think his name was Hal Finney, and he's gone. But it's only Elon because back when Barack Obama was the president. Elon was telling everybody to be afraid of AI. And so it's like this guy was was concerned about what it was capable yep. of and voicing that way before anybody else. And yep. then and then after Chat GPT comes up, they're like, oh, he's just jealous of Sam Altman and Chat GPT. It's like, no, motherfucker. He gave them like $70 million as a nonprofit. He he helped name the product and, and was a part of it. And then and then they took it and they became a you know, for a private company with Microsoft. And so it's like, and but he still, it's not like he was saying that stuff because of spite. He was saying it because he is worried about it. And now he's like, well, you know what? Instead of just being worried about it destroying us, I should make sure that we're the ones that are in the lead. And I think that's brilliant. And I also, I there's anybody else. I think Tesla hits AGI first, the head of everybody else, Jesse. I agree. Totally agree. And then I think, I think what Alex Karp and his team do too, I love him because He's for protecting America. He's for yep. making it to where we have better products and we're producing. Yep. And he wants he wants free countries, which I believe is the best form of government in the world, to prosper. And it's like that kind of stuff I love. So if there's anybody else, it's like Alex. I trust him more too. And he, his crazy hair, just the way he acts. He's more like me. He's just a little weird sometimes. And I like that about him. Same with Elon Musk. And he's not apologetic. Like uh, he's basically saying what we all think. Like uh, there's a lot of there's there's a multi-decade campaign 
uh, that is basically being played by the KGB playbook, which is basically to cause uh, people in the U.S. to distrust their own government, right? Yeah. So totally. governments yep. are not perfect. Politicians are liars. We know this for a fact, okay? Nobody thinks that politicians are saints. Nobody thinks that the U.S. is perfect. Nobody thinks that the government is all just doing things for the benefit of the... Obviously, they all steal, they lie, they cheat. It's granted, right? But all yep. governments do. The question is, like, some governments uh, do more uh, more, more stealing. Some governments do more uh, beneficial things. It depends on how much checks and balances system you have to enforce the progress of the system over, or, you know, basically self, uh, self-dealing, self so to speak, right? So the U.S. has been, in my opinion, uh, systematically better than anybody else in getting the government to do more good for the greater good than stealing for themselves. Of course, they all steal that. That's fine. Yeah. And uh, what what I think you 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 have this this uh, this conversation right now is that the people in the U.S. are basically saying, well, look, our government is working against us, and we don't trust our own government. That's that's a psyop campaign that's designed totally. to distract you from the fact that there's actual evil and good in this world, right? Nobody says yeah. it's saints, and and it's not the saint and the devil, right? Uh, out of that's what I, I keep asking these people who I meet, uh, these TikTok kids, and they're like, okay, sure, if the U.S. is so bad, it's so evil, where would you want to live? Would you want to live yeah. in China? Would you want to live yeah. in Russia? And then the, the one time you tweet something about Putin, you're going to be in, you're going to be gone? You want to live in North Korea? Where do you want to live? Tell me one place you'd rather live in, right? Uh, that's not the West. And you can choose, like in the West, obviously, there's many choices. Uh, you can live in, uh, you know, Norway or Finland or Sweden or, or Germany or the U.S., but you don't want to live underneath uh, the, those regimes. So what? when I hear Alex Carp speak, I'm proud of him because he's basically saying, look, the U.S. is not perfect. We have lots of flaws, but we're the best you guys, you motherfuckers have. So yes. you better fucking okay. support us. Otherwise, the alternative is going to be much, much worse. Because yeah. if you think we're bad, the other guys are 10 times worse. And I think he's 100% right. Um, and I love the fact that he's not apologetic about uh, what he believes in. And I'm sure it cost them business, by the way. Imagine how much business Palantir lost by not working in China, bro. Yeah, they got shit on Massive. a lot, too, by people because just like, again, like you alienate people when you're opinionated, right? Like, I think we're both yeah. kind of that way, too. So, like, you alienate no, some people with that. But it's like, to me, if you don't have a stance, then are you really thinking about anything? And I 100% agree. Yeah, go to fucking Norway. But if the United States isn't around to help keep the world free with our military and the connections and our world reserve currency, then what happens to it? Do you want to live in communist Russia where a dictator could throw you out a window when he wants to? Do you want to live in China where millions of Uyghur Muslims are imprisoned and their body parts are harvested for organs? And if you don't yeah. believe that's true, how is it? Bro, fucking people in Iran are fucking stoning heart? women in the street. Oh yeah, yeah. It, I ran all these other like places. People in Iran getting stoned in the streets because all of it. And we have our own problems. We have our own problems. We have fucked up ghettos and all kinds of stupid shit. But that's a different issue. That's an issue yeah. with our money and our, and the way it's structured and the fact that it's devalued and the fact that poor people stay poor because they don't have vehicles to help enrich them and their money loses value and nobody fucking teaches them to invest. That's I, like you learn this from mentors or other people. Right now, I will say this, though. I think that we're at a time where it's like with YouTube and people like you and me yeah. and many others, it's like you have no excuses anymore. It's like you and can reach free. out all around the world. You could live in a ghetto and you can still learn how to better your life. And I do agree 100 percent. Sure, this country has blemish, blemishes, but we don't enslave millions of Muslims and then chop them up. We don't stone women to death because yeah. they didn't wear a scarf on their head one fucking yeah. time. Like we don't, we we're, we're much better than the alternatives and you can't, and I do believe it's a PSYOP com- campaign. I mean, we know that Russia and some of these, some of these Arab nations and Qatar and, and uh, China, and we know yeah. these in North Korea, we know they work together for this stuff. So we can let them divide us. We can pull tribes up between like red and blue and do stupid shit like that and then turn and then maybe destroy our democracy because we push to one extreme or the other, or we could just realize that the money is broken and that there's other people that want to murder us and we can't let them do that. And that's why I love Elon Musk. I love Alex Karp. 
And I love Satoshi Nakamoto, otherwise known as Hal Finney, because these people are trying to give us a lifeline to make the world a beautiful place. And that's what I want it to be. And that's what, that's how I invest. And I think you're the same way. Like you're looking for things that are making it better and you speak up your mind. I won't go into specific cases, but there were times where I was getting shit on before I was even a YouTuber and you helped me out and spoke up for me on X. And I really appreciate that. I appreciate the people that have conviction and care about the world and the future and making it better and then stand up for that. I think that's what we all need to be doing. I have no problem taking shit on social media. Uh, and I'll I'll happily take it. And I don't give a fuck. I'll yeah, block yeah. people. I'll, I don't give a fuck. But uh, if I'm wrong, I'll admit it. And if I fucked up, I admit it. Just uh, two weeks ago, I took a huge L, bro. <laughs> what was that? What I, took it, I took it like a man, bro. Uh, I was on some podcast and I thought some guy was saying, oh, we think Alex Harp should leave the company. And I basically blasted it all over him on the, on the, on X. And then apparently he came out and said, no, I said, lead, not leave. He has an accent. <laughs> uh, some yeah, Italian yeah. dude. And then everybody basically went at my neck. And then I basically, look, fucked up. Take the L. But I saw that. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, that's great, though. Like, it's good that you do yeah. that. I fuck up, too. I have blocked people where later on I'm like, shit, they were right. Do I remember that person's name? <laughs> yeah, so many, uh, they're gone. Sorry, dude. <laughs> Such a long block list, bro. <laughs> yeah, my, my block list is, I think I did four bro, today. I block I people bad. on X sometimes without, when even, bro, have you ever blocked some, I block people when they don't even interact with me because I see they comment some stupid shit on somebody else's shit and I just block them. They don't even know I exist, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, like don't, don't ever let me see this person again. <laughs> I try to do that. I wish X, I'm so though, happy the problem with that if I look up keywords, I still see people that are blocked and I wish they would filter it where I don't have to see their shit because it's like, I'm looking up Bitcoin, yeah. not the 15 people that I blocked or Tesla or Palantir. Palantir. I love Palantir. I love Alex Carp and I love a lot of that community, but there's also some crazy motherfuckers in there. And so it's in like, I don't want them bro. coming up my feed. <laughs> yeah. But there's crazies in every community. Some people, they True. view themselves uh, as, you know, is, uh, this, uh, they take this a little bit too seriously. But hey, speaking of Palantir, so you're yeah. a big Bitcoin maximalist, right? Uh, 150,000 by the end of the year, 30%, uh, uh, including having in 40, 40 days. You're, you're yeah. very bullish on uh, micro strategy, 10x from here. And I totally understand why. Um, so we spoke about that. Um, let's move on to, we spoke about Tesla. We're both bullish on Tesla. So let's talk about Palantir. So obviously, you know my position on Palantir. I don't need to talk too much about it. Uh, can you share with me kind of a combined view about Palantir, both from the technical perspective of the, the trader in you for the rest of the year and yeah, more your yeah. long-term vision of, about the company? So I know it's a complicated question, but you, you can handle it. No, that's cool, man. Um, yeah, see, I from a trading perspective, I don't like the stock right now. I don't over the short term, right? Like I'm more focused on like Bitcoin accumulating Tesla, that kind of stuff. But, and you can see here, like, I won't go into all the technical stuff, but like, this is where I bought in, like right about here, it's called an inverse head and shoulders. It's a good technical pattern. And then I did a bunch of research. I was watching people like you amid just a bunch of people in Palantir. And I learned that, Hey, I can make a bunch of money. I said, Hey, we're going up to at least here. I sold out of it. I made 600 K. I've been waffling back and forth. That seems to be what a lot of the Palantir people hate right now. Because I'm like, oh, I think we could go down. And we go down. I, I think we could go up. Oh, let me fix this. Evidently, 50 gig isn't enough memory. Um, but but I've been waffling back and forth. And we keep, the problem is, like, if you look at this on a from a technical perspective, and then I'll go into the company, it, it has some bearish divergence is what they call this. Like when the RSI and the MACD are pulling down at the bottom here and the price is still climbing. So from a technical level with this stock, and I've been telling people this for a while, if you look up here, you can see how it's hitting this resistance line. I was hoping it was gonna go above it. I think if we would have got like S&P inclusion stuff, we probably would and we'd be at like 30. But I don't look at Palantir over the short term as the best risk adjusted reward when it's already ran at one point here, like 360% from where it was last year about this time. Um, and it is a $56 billion company. I do think, though, that it's a great investment. And so even people that just hold it 
will be rewarded greatly in the years ahead as this company continues to grow and expand. And I also look at Palantir as a hedge against war because they've helped out in Ukraine and they've learned a lot and they probably helped improve a lot. And they're already getting these big contracts like Titan. So if we go to war, I actually think like I think Bitcoin is a good hedge over the next six to 12 months. I think Palantir is a good hedge well beyond that. And so I love this stock from that standpoint. And so I think I only I own one share right now. I hate to say that, but I did make 600 grand. So I feel, feel like there's, you know, everybody overlooks that when they're. So when you they're left the position off. short term? Am, am I what? Sorry. You exited Palantir for now? Is it? Is it yeah. Are I, you I actively trade, right? Though. I did this a while ago. Like maybe I did it like over here in like the 18. So I missed upside. And I told people at the time, like, I can miss upside on this, but I don't think it's an asymmetric bet right now. And that's what I specialize in. Like mm -hmm. I'm a bottom feeder. I'm invested in like all this shit that nobody wants. I did that with Tesla when it was like a hundred dollars. I did it with Palantir when it was in the sevens. Like I'm invested in like PayPal, Square, um, Hood, SoFi, Arc Genomics, Bitcoin, like just a bunch of things that you well, you buy stuff. when the sentiment is horrible. Essentially, I buy when it's horrible. I love bottom feeding because if that's I why know Tesla that is so exciting right now, isn't it? Huh? Tesla is exciting right now from that perspective. From my, I hope it keeps dropping. Like I would love. Mm. I've said this before, but Tesla topped out around four twenty. I would love it if it went down to sixty nine dollars. I would be so happy because that would make Elon happy because he loves those numbers. And I think it would prove that we're living in the matrix and we're like NPCs and, and Elon's video. Game. <laughs> you know what I mean? I think it would prove yeah. that we're in his video game because he wins all the time. Even when the bad guys think that wow. he's losing, he's not. And I would just Bro, love Elon has caused, range. caused so many divorces of shorts. <laughs> oh, <laughs> over yeah. the past I'm sure years. wiped bro. out over the years. Just wiped out. <laughs> So uh, before we go, I have to give this to Tanner because Tanner is here. So we'll talk about SoFi and PayPal in a second, which I know you love both. Uh, so Palantir, uh, short term floor for you. Uh, you're not yeah, in the stock anymore, term. obviously. I mean, we might be at it and it could start going up. I think S&P inclusion will be huge. I actually think so. Get, just to back it up and give you my macro perspective. We there's global liquidity right now is high. And like I said, 35 to 40 percent of the money that's ever been printed was printed. It's still all out there. Six trillion is sitting in money markets. There's just yep. there's money sitting around waiting for rates to drop. And when they drop, people have less of an incentive to keep the money in these accounts. And when they drop, it will be a sign for banks that they could start lending more as long as the economy isn't falling apart. So I think that. I don't know. The floor for me, worst case, is maybe like 20, 24 to 21. Worst case, I think that's probably where we're at, unless I'm completely wrong about the macro, which could be true. I don't think. Uh, did we lose Jesse? Uh, guys, let me know if you can still see me because I can't see Jesse anymore. Okay. My, my shit dropped. I'm back. Because I didn't know if you lost uh, the feed or I was out of feed. Because some no, you never know. Yeah, I was like, me. am I frozen or is he frozen? I don't know. My, my computer, I spent a fortune on it. I've got 128 gig of memory and it still doesn't work fucking right half the time. So I don't know. They're, these guys are trying to talk me into a Mac, but I don't want to. But no, so is I this think a that, Ford computer? <laughs> yeah, right. No, I don't go legacy. <laughs> but it's definitely not a Tesla because I put it together. So that that's probably the problem. It's probably me. But I think the floor, though, with I the floor could be now for Palantir if I'm right about global liquidity and and markets getting better. This week will be a big decider of that. You can pull up your chart again. I'll, I'll put it on the screen, by the way. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me do if that. I want to show it. Uh, this will be a big week for so, that. Though, because, yeah, go ahead. Big, big week for what? Uh, for inflation. Tuesday, Thursday, uh, we get mm. we get like CPI, PPI Michael. data. And so if that goes well, I think that. Yep. I think that we're going to see rates coming May or June, May at the earliest, June at the latest. Yep. And when that happens, I think banks start to lend more. I think the real estate market opens up from that because yeah, right yeah, now yeah. people don't sell houses because they're like, why the fuck would I get a house for 7% when my loan is like three? Like they're no, just no, not going to open the it. floodgates. It Everything is future priced. Yep. So obviously the interest rates policy is priced six months forward. 
and yep. that CPI exactly. data is going to, yeah, yeah. I think we exactly. probably don't see it before Ju July, August, September, probably more likely, but it will be priced in if the CPI data is low. So uh, Tanner's here. I would like to give him some clout. Uh, go subscribe yeah. to his channel. Uh, he doesn't have a huge channel yet. He's going to be huge one day. Uh, one of the best, uh, one of the best in the business. I like this kid a lot. And uh, so Tennis here is a huge SoFi PayPal guy. You as well. So what do, what are your thoughts? Uh, similar, same question as Palantir fundamentals and technicals for SoFi and PayPal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me pull that one up. I'm, I'm gonna move something around here because I can't see shit on my screen. Let me just go over here. I like that. He's a good kid. He's how old is he? Like 15, 16? 26. He looks 15. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding, Dan. Love you, Dan. No, but he's a uh, he's uh, he has he's a great a, he's channel. Brilliant. I love his channel. Here's yeah, the deal, man. When I was 26, I was like stoned all the time and probably yeah, still man. doing coke. So the fact that this guy has a YouTube channel about finance, he bought a house. He's like, I think he's a gate. Like he's he's doing so many things right in his life. It's amazing. Yeah, he, he I, has I his I head screwed on, bro. Yeah. yeah, he's so good. He's really good. As but a yeah, parent, so you always want a kid like like uh, like Tanner. You know, a kid is just like doing all the right choices. Like, but usually we get like no kidding. <laughs> it's very true. Yeah, man. I, my my daughter. I yeah. hope she doesn't turn out like me. Hopefully, she's a lot more like Tanner. But um, yeah, for SoFi, I was gonna say. So you can see this. What what is previously resistance from a technical standpoint? You can see where it was resistance here. Looks like a shoulder, head, shoulder. It's got a similar setup, just broader um, than than Palantir had. And then we've turned it into support. We did it here, 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 here. This is on the weekly, but if you zoom in, like you can see where we dipped under it. It looks like we were going lower, but we've been finding support on this. We've done it twice here recently. So this, from a technical standpoint, looks great. And then it got crushed. Because of the seven hundred and fifty yep. million dollar offering they did, Tanner can speak to it better than I can. Yeah, um, but they, it's basically something that that is due in twenty twenty nine, and there's some there's a there's a lot of technical things behind it from a banking perspective that I won't pretend to 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 know fluently. But the gist of it is the stock has an incentive to go up to twelve dollars, a little bit more, and it doesn't have an incentive to go over fourteen because of the way they have their calls and all this banking yeah. related shit that they're doing. So I think we can run to 12 pretty easy. That gets me, you know, 55% from where we're at or 50, maybe something like that. And I've got calls on this, which gives me a multiplier to that. So I could make like, I think it's eight to 10 X now, the underlying, if it goes up 54%. And that's kind of what I specialize. I don't, I don't like, I, I'm, I, I use leaps a lot lately, lately options, but they're also like, they're incredibly powerful tools that when people don't know how to use them, they just get destroyed. So I, I don't know. I'm weary sometimes about talking about it, but that's what I'm doing with a lot of these plays that are just really oversold down 80% right now. So far still down 72 from its SPAC debut. So it's, yep. it's got a ways to go up still. It's one of the only SPACs that I actually like. I can't Agreed. think of a, a lot of the SPACs that I like. This yeah. one is, uh, is legit. Uh, I think it's, I like it a lot. I don't understand technical trading at all. Uh, but uh, from a, you know, fundamental perspective, I like the CEO. I like Anthony Noto. He's a G. Brilliant. Uh, he's a, they, they got a good vision going on over there. They're taking the right steps. They got that bank charter, which is huge. People don't talk about that enough. They completely pivoted from this fucking, uh, just a one trick pony student loan business into this whole new kind of, uh, um personal finance uh, platform i yeah, i think everything. they got a yeah they got a lot of potential they got a great team and and they're not expensive at seven at all i mean i like that uh, dude the stock. they're like 7.5 uh, billion yeah. it's a stupid low number and i will say real quick i 100% would agree with everything you said um but these guys too since they're a bank they've been artificially depressed uh right yeah. now because they're seen as a riskier bank but as yep. rates lower, if the economy isn't plumbing, plummeting, which I don't think it will, because I don't think unemployment's mm -hmm. going that high. That's a whole other thing. We can do that some other time. But these guys are beneficiaries of lower rates. So and and again, I think they're yep. drastically oversold. So I'm excited about this one, too. There's a misunderstanding about rates in banks. Uh, people just assume high rates are good for banks. Low rates are bad for banks. It's not necessarily the case. In fact, uh, yeah. There's a, there's a little bit of misunderstanding there. Like I, I like like when I saw Anthony Noto buying stock in the open market and buying a lot of it, I'm talking millions of dollars worth of stock. 
Oh, it's just a good confidence open, builder. Just straight up buying like a G. I was like, okay, this is this is for real. And yeah, who does that? I really, nobody does that shit because they nobody all get uh, they all get grants and options and RSUs and what they all buy at a fucking discount, which is okay. I mean, that's that's how the business works, right? I've yeah, I've yeah. never seen a CEO go heavy like that. Just that fucking secondary buys like like a machine gun, bro. So that's yeah, what I need. I think so hey, yeah, yeah, uh, PayPal, PayPal. So explain to me this okay. thing about PayPal. Look, the one thing I know about PayPal, look, PayPal, I, I know the narrative is bad, dinosaur, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The one yeah. thing I know about PayPal is very simple. Look, I don't know nothing about their new technologies, acquisitions, nothing. I I know for a fact that if you are in uh, e-commerce uh, and you have PayPal in your checkout, then your abandoned carts goes down by 40%. Yeah. That's a stat PayPal's that's amazing. Been, uh, yeah. Yeah. They've got like big commerce and some of these other companies that they work with. And Tanner's actually, he'd be a good one. Maybe the three of us sometime could get on a, on a thing together, but he's really great with all the fintech bank related stuff better than me. But, but I know enough to talk about it. And I, I love this company. I've actually got a huge bet. I've put about, I don't know, maybe a half a million dollars into, into leaps for PayPal, both 2025 and 2026. Because people don't, don't, don't realize how fucking rich you are, bro. They think you're like this, this ba basement kid, bro. <laughs> they don't understand. I used to. Like, well, I mean, this is the basement, so part of that is true. And no, I, I'm like, a high people don't understand because you don't brag enough about uh, the fact that. that you oh, actually, I brag a decent amount. You have fuck you money, <laughs> but I'm not totally humble. But but no, it's like one of those things where I think I've I, I've got a pretty heavy bet on this, and part of that is because it's down over eighty percent from its high. It's trading at levels it traded at in 2017. And when you look at the financials on this company, I'm just going to show you this real quick, man. It is beautiful. Why um, are you not this, using Stock MVP, my guy? Uh, because I, my friend Alejandro gave me this, and it's awesome. I'll give I you Stock it. MVP for free, I'll and you'll it use it. You'll I'll use it, it more than this one. I promise you, bro. I will check it out. I'll check it out. But bro, yeah, we check just crossed 5,000 users on Stock MVP, by the way. Cool, man. That's a that's a lot. Yeah, I'll dude, I'll I'll take anything, especially if you give it to me for free. I will check it out. And probably. we we just had we're a Cypriot company, so yeah. we just had our first annual tax returns, and we're first year profitable, slightly but profitable. Cool, man. That's awesome. Yeah, that's and we're self funded. Yeah, I love that. I love self made self people. I I slowly turn myself into one. Me after and, a lot. and Pete and one other guy, and uh, it's all U.S. dev dev teams, so no. It's all US based. So all the devs are US based. It's all like our HR costs are very, very high, but like it's none, no, like no disrespect, but no like foreign subcontractors from. Yeah, yeah. Well, that can get country. messy too. It's horrible to manage yeah. having people across the I'll show the you after the stream. The it's actually pretty good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, I'll check it out, man. Uh, but no, what, one of the things I wanted to talk about here sometimes people were talking about active customer account dropping for this. They talk about that with Hood too. It's stupid. But look at the, the total payment volume. I'm going to switch to year on this is sick. And I'm going to shrink it up a little bit. So if you look at where these guys were in 2017, this is what they're priced for, right? So they had 261 million in the United States and 196 in international. 2023, 974 million in the US, 553 international. Look at their net income. These guys printed $4.2 billion. 2.4 the uh, the one before that 4.1 before that they're they're yep. printing money they have tons of it they have a 10.5 billion in approved stock buybacks for this year that they can do and they're sitting at an 80 percent drop and it's all because people are caught up in old shit this company did where they were stupid they did the ice road trucker thing in canada i'm probably mixing up a tv show with canada but whatever they in Canada, they, they these truckers tried to protest and they they lock these guys down. And then PayPal and other companies that are woke decided to freeze funds and do stupid shit. And then there was there was a program that they never implemented where if people were factually inaccurate on social media, they might take money out of their account in PayPal. Like this was just stupid. But these things were over two years ago. They have yep. a new CEO now. He fumbled in the beginning because he said he was going to shock the world. And then he created a video for merchants. And everybody's like, what the fuck is this? I don't even know what this is. But the stuff he's talked about is brilliant. They're making it to where with an email address, you could check out of any retailer online. These guys control 
what is it, 25 percent of e-commerce transactions are through this company, like a stupid number for, for the world. And and they're growing like crazy. They've got tons of cash. They're adding more of it. They can buy back their shares. They're doing all this low hanging fruit to make their apps better, to combine the silos of Venmo. A lot of people don't realize Venmo is PayPal, but it is. Yep. And so PayPal and Venmo apps are going to get consolidated. They've made it to where all the reporting data in, in the company, which is in multiple silos, is now one. And, and Alex Chris, the CEO, did all this shit in like a couple of quarters. So I'm super impressed with them. Um, and there's a lot more than this. But like when I look at this and I look at like these key charts, I look at their estimates going forward. It, it's good stuff. It's what you want to see a company do. You want to see strength. And they set expectations stupid low by saying they're not growing this year. So it's like, and, and everywhere you go, every everything, you like, like you said, online, where I go to check out, PayPal is the top option every time. And now they're doing this NFC thing where they can, you, you could basically pay with a PayPal card um, right on somebody's phone and just reducing friction and making it to where, you know, it's super easy and QR codes and just all these things to make yep. it easy to use their product. And like you said at the beginning, make it to where the conversion rate is high. Make it to where merchants want this shit. So they pitch it to their customers and then make it great for the customers. And so I'm a huge advocate for this one. I get shit on all the time for it. But you want to see something cool? Yeah, yeah. What do you got? Let's do PayPal fundamentals. I'll okay. I'll, uh, I'll blow your mind. Uh, so this is stock MVP. Okay. Okay. Cool. So let's go over it together. I think you're gonna love this. Okay. So look. Uh, so obviously it's down. So it's down 17 percent on the year, uh, flat for the past three months. But it's down. Go to five. On the year. Looks even worse. But <laughs> that yeah, one's yeah, okay. dramatic. So under two percent short interest, which is quite low. Yep. Uh, yep. You have. For the past three years, they gave you 40% revenue growth. For the past five years, 92% revenue growth. Still growing nicely at 8% past year, a little bit of a slowdown, but quite nice. Uh, they're insanely profitable. Their net income is 4.2 billion. Yeah, so out of 30 crazy. billion of revenue, you're getting 4.2 billion. That's a huge margin. And the net it's income over the past huge. But look yeah. at what happened. Over the past year, that's the strength of the platform, I'll show you. Over the past yeah, yeah. year, the... Uh, net income increased by 75%. Yeah. Even though revenue only went up by eight. Just goes to show you how good management is, bro. Yeah, Imagine they laid off school. like 9% of their workforce too, which Squeezing was smart. so much you guys are lemon, great. bro. Yeah. Look, cash and cash equivalents, $9 billion, right? Uh, they uh, Assets to liabilities, 82 to 61. So way more assets and liabilities. Debt to cash is pretty much one-to-one. -one. So a clean balance sheet, bro. Way more assets. Way more cash, uh, return on equity twenty one percent, return on capital fifteen percent. Look at this forward PE eleven point seven under twelve PE. No. It's Look, sick for a tech company. Price, price to sales is actually uh, two. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's like price to sales two, and it's not volatile one point four beta. Uh, it's and uh, hey, I'll show you something else. Uh, the crazy part about this, if I go and I go here, uh, check this out. So I'm changing tabs. So this is the, the insider selling and buying tab. Blue means buying. Red man, means selling. The top one is the last three months. The, the second one is the last six months. So the you past six months, buying. look at this. Look at how many I really like that tab. I really like that tab. Bro, when I show you Stock MVP, you're going to come in your pants, bro. It's such a good platform because <laughs> I built it. It's built my, for me. My wife knows it doesn't it? take much, so bro, it's possible. I, I'm 42, bro. Trust me. All I need is a, a breath. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> For the next week, bro. <laughs> oh, God. Anyways, it's old people humor, bro. Nobody will understand this. <laughs> um, anyways, so we built this because like uh, out of deficiencies, we could we needed. But basically, look at the insider buying here, bro. Last six months, yeah, 570,000 buys, 176 sales. Last three months. Again, massive double sell, buying and selling. And if we run this, uh, if we run this real quick through the, we have a valuator uh, uh, thingy right here. So sure. if you run it through the valuator, let's give it ten percent, a conservative twenty percent optimistic revenue growth. 
Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think that's right. And let's give it on the optimistic 10% uh, weighted average cost of capital. I like the and calculator. Let's just go man. from 14 to 20 across the board. Uh, yeah. Yeah. On the multiples. So this is what you have. So the floor for you would be with, you know, buying the stock at 60. Uh, the floor for you would be $74 in five years. That's a five year estimate, right? So the yeah, floor would be $74. Great. So you're gonna under, under so if that's the case, you're underperforming the market a little bit, but you're still you know you're not gonna lose money, right? But look at this yeah, massive yeah. upside. Like you can you can really make some you know if they if they can give you twenty percent revenue growth a year, you can really make a lot of money here. Uh, so uh, people who like shit on PayPal, they don't understand that basic fundamental analysis like the one we just did right now. Yeah, it is it, it's just it, it's a no brainer. It's it's such it's a, a no brainer. Sure. Yeah, it's a no-brainer. Well, and, and Ace is he's a, he's he's not great on like conference calls. And again, he's told people he was going to shock the world, and that just pissed them off. And then and then he set expectations for no growth for the year. So it's it was a rocky start. But, but they sandbagged those on purpose, bro. I think they told. That's my theory, man. They totally sandbagged it. He realized he fucked up by saying shock the world, and he said let's sandbag earnings, set expectations low, and then outperform. And I think that's what he's going to do. And uh, and I think, again, 25 percent yeah. e-commerce, one of the main things he's trying to do is get it to where I don't know if I lost my video, but one of the main things he's trying to do is get it to where I can still hear you. Um, you can hear me. OK, cool. We'll just go with that. But one of the yeah. main things he's trying to do is get it to where they use this merchant setup with millions of merchants around the United States and around the world and make it to where when there's data that's on one of them. If they buy stuff and other other retailers that aren't even affiliated with you, the merchants can say, hey, I want to know or I want to advertise to everybody that has this, this, this and this. And then they can do that. They can help these merchants advertise because these guys have the data that shows what everybody's been buying a quarter of the world online. And, and people I, I don't understand how people can't understand the value of data right now. Look at the companies that control data and what they've been able to do. Mm-hmm. The Apples, the Amazons, where they become behemoths and and they're doing this. And I love that. And Alex Chris comes from a company. I mean, he helped he helped his company into it, like just go straight up yep. for a decade. So, like, I don't know. I think people are underestimating it and I'm happy that they are. So we lost your video, but we can hear you, which is good. Uh, yeah. This is just StreamYard being a piece of shit. I think it's on my end too, but yeah. No, no, no. I had the same issues with this with Sachin. Um so now we lost Jesse completely. So while we get Jesse back, uh stock MVP. If you didn't get it yet, stock mvpcom Uh Jesse, I'll give you one for free. But uh, if you're here in the chat, you can get it at 50% off just for this stream. It's last 50, and then I'm gonna delete the code. So uh I'm gonna plug my own stuff here. I don't deal with it. Fuck you. Cool, man. You got to. <laughs> People are like, Tom, what are you promoting? Like, like, you used to say, don't buy anything, don't sell anything. Yeah, motherfucker. Times has changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I get it, man. I Time get has it. Times changed. Now I have I run ads on my Fuck YouTube off. channel. So it's like, because yeah. I have to, like, honestly, it makes me better to have some vested interest in what I'm doing. It makes it to where I want to do it more. Like, I, I love doing yeah. what I do for free to a degree. But if I want to do a better job, it it makes me feel more rewarded with like when my advertising revenue goes up. It's like, oh, maybe I can hire somebody. Did you know YouTube doing those YouTube is not shorts. gonna show your videos? Huh? Wait, did you know if you're not monetizing, YouTube is not gonna show your videos? I know I believe that. I believe that because when I wasn't, they weren't doing it. And the second I start monetizing, yep. I get a broader reach. There's all kinds of weird stuff yep. that that like rules that are unwritten. I totally believe that. I totally believe that. I mean, it makes sense, right? They're a fucking yeah. business. <laughs> yeah, I, I think like if it's a head-to-head, uh, a non-monetized video versus a monetized video, they don't look at monetization as a factor. Sure. But I think to begin with non-monetized videos, they don't launch out of the gate the same way a normal videos out. You know, they come out. It would it's make just sense bad business for them. Yeah. It would make sense to me. I mean, if you're a business, you're trying to increase ad revenue. And so getting things out there that are giving you high returns on ads, it's like, why wouldn't you promote that? You want that. So like, I totally agree with you. I think not having ads will actually give you a slow roll 
and make it to where it's harder yeah, yeah, yeah. to get your channel up. I totally agree. Uh, so uh, uh, now that we've done uh, masturbating over a stock MVP and how good that is. Yes. Uh, I'm just so proud of what we've done with this thing, bro. We did it in a year. Uh, That's cool. That came from scratch. Because I was tired of using Seeking Alpha and the uh, Trading View and you know, like a shit ton of other tools to like this Frankenstein. This I solution. tried a bunch too, yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, anyways, I'll talk. I'll talk to you about it off offline. So uh, before we go, I have to ask you. We talked about PayPal. We talked about SoFi. We talked about Palantir. We talked about Tesla. Uh, we talked about uh, Bitcoin. Uh, your so uh, I know your position. Your uh, you don't like uh, the Chinese market. I don't like the Chinese market. I just think there's too much risk there. But yeah. what are you looking at right now that's uh, not Bitcoin or Tesla or Palantir or SoFi or PayPal that you see a lot of uh, potential in? What other companies you kind of uh, low-key uh, examining? Is the other one. If we're going risk on, the multipliers for leaps right now are what's like... What's the ticker? I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, yeah. Arc Genomics. Let me see here. I will pull up a chart too. I got one somewhere. Where do I put it? There we go. It's over here. And you can pull it up on the screen. I'll show it. I got it here. So this is just another one. Again, it's experience the pain train. Everybody loved Kathy Wood when she was making her wake making a money. And now that oh now RG, that, I got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And now that now that she hasn't, you know, been been pulling in the Benjamins, everybody hates her and talks shit about her. But she's still brilliant. She's just not she's not a great trader. I still think that I don't know, love Teladoc. I don't love um Roku. I'm got a similar mentality, I think, to um Tanner in regard to a lot of that stuff. And there's others that I don't yeah. like, but I do think that the narrative around genomics, I don't know anybody else that has a good fund right now for, for the genomic sector. But like we talked about AI and Bitcoin and all the things like Alex Carbon, the things that are making our world better, genomics will do that too. And some of these companies, even if one of them really take off and become like the Microsoft or even just something smaller of genomics, and they because yeah. somebody in the United States is going to lead, then she might own one of them. And there's like 50 of them in here. And more, so most I, likely she'll own one of them. Yes. Most likely yeah. she'll own one of them. Yeah. And so I to me, this is a no brainer. And it's yeah. down like, again, about 80 percent, 78 percent. And I can make a fortune because there's a 10x, 10x multiplier to this. So if this thing goes up 60 percent, I can make 600. So like I love this play, too. What she's doing is not new. You know, just it's basically the VC model, right? In the yeah. VC model, you basically invest in a hundred different companies when you know 99 will fail and one will be the next billion dollar business. And then wait, that's how you make your money. So RG, most likely there's plenty of trash in there, but all she yeah. needs is one Tesla. In exactly. It, so basically, that's exactly what it is. You said it. She kind of democratized it. She turned she turned yeah. VC into, a, into an ETF. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah, exactly totally what agree. she's been doing. Yeah. And people are like, oh, there's so many shit companies. That's the whole business, motherfucker. That's how yeah, VCs work. Welcome to meaning. venture capital. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. Like, because the, like, people think, oh, if like classic uh, private equity, right? You invest in good businesses, right? So this is a f potential $50 million business. This is $100 million. VCs don't want that shit, bro. They want the next Google, the next Microsoft, the next uh, Apple. They want something like that, like the next. Uh, uh, next hundred or a thousand bagger yeah they, totally they do. don't want a hundred percent return that they, they don't care about that and they don't mind yeah. losing 90 percent of the stuff yeah mm. and it makes sense and, and she's doing that and again i think like there's some things that i don't agree with her on but she was right about tesla she was right about bitcoin she hits she hits it out of the park her timing might not always be perfect on things but she's buying sofi and i think that's the right play too and she's owned hood and, and she's this is her fund and she makes, I think she makes a lot of good decisions and people can shit on her. I don't care. I still think that this is a person you want to follow. And this is one of the more unique funds that she has because I got a really good bead on like FinTech, I feel like. And again, like finance related stuff, technology related stuff. I feel like I could go that my own, but I don't want to spend time researching 50 fucking genomics companies. So I'll let, I'll outsource that to her. And she's got a track record, I think that proves it. And there isn't any, there isn't any other competitor. So yep. to me, this is it. And so I'm I'm excited about this one too. I think this could do well. Uh, somebody's asking a clean spark price target. I don't think we mentioned oh, it. Yeah, I dropped a bunch today. Definitely All the guessing. miners dropped today, right? Oh, big time. Yeah. And that happens. That's like one of the things I was talking about. But you got to look at it too. So like perspective, right? So on January 16th, a whole three and a half weeks ago, 
this thing traded at six dollars and change. Mm -hmm. And right now people are freaked the fuck out because we're at 1733. So I'm sorry that you're in the pain. I know that the mentality of people is to buy at the top. I yeah. get that. And so if you did that and it dropped 30 or 40 percent, I feel bad for you, son. But like if you sell it here, you're a fucking idiot, in my opinion. And what you should be doing, because again, it dropped, it's dropped like 30 percent, right? And so, uh oh, is my screen locked? You still no, there? no, you're fine. Oh, yeah, this yeah, is yeah, definitely yeah. this is my PC, this part. But yeah, it's down 30 percent. I think that before you know it, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Before you know it, we're going to be at 34. I think that that happens maybe by the halving or shortly afterwards. Um, there, I think there's people right now that don't understand how miners and the halving work. And so they're scared. But these mm. miners operated a three to five X multiplier of Bitcoin. This stock right here, again, if, if you're scared, whatever, just realize that you did buy a stock that was up over 1,200% in yeah. a little over a year it's like the people and, who buy smci the thousand bro you yeah just bought it at, i was i was telling you that it's a good stock at 250 <laughs> i mean that's yeah. not the yeah, same yeah, exactly. that's not the same quality of deal it's like oh this is a great car yes it was a great car at forty thousand. it's not a great car at one hundred twenty thousand. it's still it's, a great exactly. car exactly but... that's that's exactly the comparison and here's the thing i believe the underlying asset though is still going to at least 75 to 150 yeah so if it's at 1730 right now, before it closed, it was at 1691. Like I'll just buy more. And now that PayPal is starting to go up, and now that some of these other fintechs, I'm up 400 percent on Hood. I'll just start cashing some of that out, and I'll buy more of this. And I think that this is something that people they they gotta you gotta realize what you're getting into. Don't buy an asset that's up 265 percent over six weeks if you can't handle 30 percent down. A couple weeks. I think later. that's the biggest problem of retail. It's just yeah, the, the ability to get comfortable with volatility. I think that's the definition I was looking for. Yeah, they love. Need... They're okay with volatility when it's up. <laughs> no, but that's that's not really volatility, bro. Volatility yeah, 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 has yeah. the size, bro. Yeah, it's like uh, it's Harvey Dent, bro. There's the you know Harvey Dent had a. <laughs> uh, there's a the, the the there's a dark side to volatility. I'm, look, I'm saying like if you, that's the strength. Which, which which I think I try to preach and I, I know you preach. It's yeah. like if you can get behind your thesis and understand what it is you're buying and understand the quality of the underlying asset, then you're not gonna be as panicked exactly. when it drops 20%. So if you unless you do the homework. If you're buying shit you don't understand, yes, then when it drops 20%, you're gonna be panicking. You need to understand what halving means, what what miners do, what kind of volatility they have, like. If you don't understand this, then you're going to panic into stupid decisions. That's simple yeah, as that. Yeah, that's exactly what happens. And I try and warn people. I try and tell them, like, like this thing could drop 30%. It could drop 40%. It could drop 50%. That's fucking this Bitcoin, is a bro. really loose rubber band yeah. tied to Bitcoin. So I try to tell Imagine having that. like a 4.5 beta on Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is. It's at least three to five. And so, oh my God. so if you can't stomach it, I'm sorry, but you should understand what Bitcoin is if you're going to get yeah. into it so that you don't get scared when it starts to go down. But again, it's up right now. It was up 1200% in less than a year or maybe a little bit over. And now it's still up like 800. Well, the 800%. good news are, is that once, uh, once the floodgates open, once the Fed actually has to acknowledge interest rate reductions, lowering rates, yeah, that six, uh, that six uh, trillion, uh, it would go fucking. Uh, yeah, and thing. all these yeah. fucking companies that have all this money, yeah. they're going to be doing stock buybacks. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. alone will propel the market because if they can't get money from yield, they're going to buy back their own fucking stock, especially if it's low. Just like PayPal. Hey, did you see the Tom Lee post today? I like Tom Lee a lot. Do you like Tom Lee? I love Tom Lee. I didn't see what he posted. Did you see his post today? No. What was it? Bro, you have to go to my profile. It's I think I believe it's my latest uh, post. And I just I just I just shared it and I said Tom Lee is a G. You have to see it, bro. He is is an absolute stud. I love Tom. Bro. Um, I saw one post from him with his girl. I think he was talking about Bitcoin, but it like had her on it. Yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's the one. That's the one. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I saw that one, dude. I did. Yeah, that was great. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I see it. I see it. Tom Lee's a G, bro. <laughs> yeah, I even commented on this one too. Yeah, he is great. He really is. Uh, man, I like him a lot. I am. Um, 
I DM'd him and uh, I asked him if he wants to do an interview and said, yeah, fine, let's do it. He's such a cool guy, bro. Oh, he's so cool. He's responded to some of my posts. He's retweeted I saw me. It. I saw it. I saw and it. I, and, and I, I love the guy. Like he, he has steel he's balls, so right. bro. He does he, not well, get scared at all. No, he reminds me of like, again, he reminds me of Kathy Wood. He'll go against the grain. Yeah. People will hate him. him if he's wrong for a year and then he'll crush it for three. And all, all they'll remember is that they don't like him from one year, even though he's going with the market, which is 90% up most of the time. And so he's, he's, he's a winner and people don't listen to him or they hate on him because he's, because they're bearish still because they weren't in the market over the last year. Look, so I, like, I, can I tell you something, Jesse? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, the beauty of, of my investment style is like, look, I couldn't be more opposite of Tom Lee in late of uh, 2022. Okay. Oh, End sure, of yeah, 22, 22 comes in. Yeah. Tom Lee says we're heading into a bullish cycle. And I say we're heading into the, one of the biggest crashes in the in the history of the United States. I literally said it. I got it completely wrong. Could have went okay. either way. Hey, it is what it is. I'm going to own up to my fuck-ups, okay? So I yeah, completely yeah. went the opposite. And I'm on record saying it because I don't hide my shit, right? However, that's the crazy part. First of all, shout out to Tom. All respect to him for getting it right when nobody got it right because everybody yep. were bearish. 100%. So shout out to him. But the crazy part about this is even though I got... The and by the way, Chris on point again as always. Dan Ives, same yeah, he's thing. Great. He's same great thing, too. bro. Same thing. Uh, and such an astute uh, fashion sense, bro. I love Dan Ives suits, bro. Anyways, so uh, so I got macro opposite, like couldn't be more wrong, and still did over a hundred percent so far since January of twenty twenty three up until now. Cool. For the sole reason because I don't bearish, trade. That's damn good. No, because <laughs> I don't trade. I don't trade. And yeah, I just yeah, dollar cost yeah. average into into the stocks I like, no matter what. And I just dollar cost average more when they come down heavier. So I lean yeah, into that's actually a really chill way to to invest. That I would say at least eighty percent of people should probably do. Maybe just 90. lean into weakness as yeah. long as you didn't pick a loser, right? If you pick the loser, then you're fucked. But yeah, it's just understanding, you... just doing the homework. Yeah. Like like you said, you got to know the shit you're invested in. Don't follow yeah. me or you just because we have a YouTube channel. Like take some time to understand what you're doing. If you're not doing that, if you if you don't kind of understand the world and your investment, you're pretty fucked. And if it, even if you don't understand what's happening in the world tomorrow, if you yeah. at least know that you've got a good investment, you're gonna be okay. You need to have a process, bro. That's why, like on my Patreon, I know you have a Patreon, I have a Patreon, deal with it, haters. We don't give a fuck, right? On my yeah, yeah. Patreon, I don't offer any stock picks at all. All of my stock reviews are out in the open. For free. The only thing I offer my Patreon, I teach the, the system, I teach the process, I teach the method, how to evaluate, how, how to do fish. this. I educate. Yeah, yeah. I don't I don't basically feed them stock tips. Th those are free out there because I don't want people to say, Oh, Tom, you're feeding up. I want people what you're saying. I want people to learn the yeah. process. For me, that's premium. The stock picks are not premium because that's just a fucking opinion, bro. Who gives that's actually a, a really about... smart way to do that. I might have to yeah. think about that myself. <laughs> yeah, there's no stock picks behind my yeah, paywall. Yeah. None. It, we that's we do smart. lectures about how to evaluate, how to manage risk, uh, how to read financials, like skills, bro. We, yep. Because stock picks are basically an opinion. Some dude in the fucking underwear in some basement thinks it's a great stock. So what, bro? You have yeah, to yeah. do impressive. Half of them are idiots. I'm sorry, like half the analysts out there know less about the shit that I'm invested in than I do. Bro, half of the people on this podcast that are streaming right now are idiots. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's, that's probably true. That's probably true. I mean, that's why they're here, right? <laughs> that's that's true, though. Very true. Um, we should we should rename the, the this uh, the podcast to Standard and Poor. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> I like it. I and they'll guess which one is which, bro. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, but it's very true, though. You got to know the stuff you're invested in. If you don't, yeah. like, that's the foundation. You got to, it's better to teach somebody to fish than to spoon feed them some fucking stuff. And then when shit yeah, goes yeah. bad, like you said, they have no conviction. And nah. then they're like, Jesse, why are miners going down? I don't know, because I told you they could and they probably would yeah, at man. some point. And we get shit so, wrong all the time. That's the thing they don't understand. Like we get, I got macro completely oh, yeah, wrong. Yeah. You got things I'm not wrong. Perfect. Like, I'm not a perfect human being. How crazy yeah. is that? The the like the 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 game though is get more often right 
than wrong. I, I, I butchered it. It's not my first no, language. Yeah, it's good enough. I, I, I fuck up analogies all the time, but I totally yeah. agree. Like, you just got to Bro, win a few more. days ago, I was recording a video, and I don't, you know, I don't edit, and I don't script, okay? Yeah, yeah. So all my videos, I turn on the camera, and I just fucking talk. And then I turn it off, and I upload it, right? So you've seen my videos. There's no effort in the production quality of it, right? Yes. Yeah, I put effort in the audio, in the video quality, but I don't fucking edit. I don't have patience for this. So I was doing a video and I had a mixed up two analogies. And I basically, and when the train comes, you're going to be naked on the train tracks. I was like, oh shit, that's two different analogies. <laughs> <laughs> People were like, I don't know what the fuck that was, but I kind of get what he was saying. Tide. It's the tide analogy with the train pennies and the train. And then <laughs> <it's coming laughs> awesome. you're going to be naked on the train tracks. <laughs> that's good though, man. That makes you real. Like, again, I fuck up all the time in mine too, but people would rather appreciate in this yeah, day man. and age where everything is fabricated and fake nah. as fuck, it's better to be a real human being in my mind. I like what but, you do. That's why I do it. You actually got me started down that. Again, I didn't even have a YouTube channel. And this guy was talking to me when I was very small on X yeah. and being supportive, trying to get me on his channel. And I was like, I'm a coward. I can't do video, Tom. I and, told uh, you like, when you had yeah, 5,000 yeah. followers, I told you you'll pass me within the year. Yeah, I don't know if that's true, but I do appreciate your support, man, because you kept pushing yeah. me to do more and you gave me great advice. And that's why I'm here today. So it's people like you and honestly, mainly you that that have given me hey. this opportunity. And I love it. I, I like to see you win. You're one of the best upcoming uh, finance channels and uh, you give great value. So why wouldn't I uh, support it, bro? So 100%. Dude, I appreciate it, man. Not, not everybody thinks that way. So I really appreciate oh, it. Oh, fuck them then. Yeah, yeah, it's a very simple answer for me, bro. I that's that's why I have a. So, so, I could have been more politically correct throughout my my career, but I've I've always chose to be like. Look, I'll I'll tell you a story. When I was working yeah. for, people tend to respect the shit. So, long long time ago, I was working on the trading floor. Uh, uh, I wasn't never. I was not a trading. It's trading floor. I was doing uh, basically compliance work. Okay. Uh, for legal and compliance work for some uh, big fund and then um, the guy who was uh, in charge of me who was the associate gc right so I was, not, I was working under the associate gc who was the second command under the general counsel right so okay. he was a he was a big shot and uh, he basically was my boss and we were working late one day and then uh, we got into this heated argument because i don't remember what happened but basically we went we got to fist fights Nobody was in the office. It was just me That's and him. Awesome. And, fist, uh, and then we just had a beer after. And then everything was cool. And we were friends to this day. This was 2008. I just spoke That's to him great. five minutes before we went on there, bro. I speak to him every That's day. That's a great bro. story, though. That's a great story. I mean, it's awesome. Yeah, that it's awesome. He probably didn't want to tell anybody about it anyway. I mean, he probably would have gotten fired. No, too. he never said anything about it. We went to have a beer. And we. I, he had a bloody nose. I had a black eye. And then we was it. That was it's like what happened to you guys? Was, I don't know, man. I I fell. He did this thing. <laughs> I'm. You know what started it? Because I I used to fold. I took my jacket and I put it on on the back of my seat, and okay. he was he would hate it. He's like hanging up. You you ruined your jacket. And we got, got into this heated argument over the ja some bullshit like this, bro. You know. That's fucking great. <laughs> he would get annoyed that people would hang their jackets on the seats, and I was his like. Him employee so he could uh, basically He's got, like, say OCD. something and, and then like motherfucker you ain't the butt <laughs> that's funny. Uh, that's but funny. yeah so i i appreciate real bro you as real as they come thank you for joining me today bro i really appreciate fun. it i i know you usually do your end of day stream so there's 600 people still watching this i don't know why but uh, thank you if you haven't yet uh, I want you to go to Jesse's channel. Jesse, if you can pull up your channel and share it, yeah. I'll put it on, on the stage. Let me find it. One uh, second. Go subscribe to Jesse's channel. Uh, in my opinion, he's one of the best uh, upcoming finance channels right now. Oh, I like what you do. I like the technical stuff. Uh, I like the fact that you mix in technicals and fundamentals. Uh, I like the fact that uh, you're not feeding people. Uh, you're explaining the rationale behind the, the choices that you make and you're not, Take ownership of the fuck ups when you do fuck up. Sometimes it happens. So this is Je Jesse's channel. Uh, micro to macro, yep. same handle on X. So if you want to follow him on X, same handle. Uh, this motherfucker just grew eighty five. Uh, sorry, fifty eight thousand. How much you have? Fifty eight thousand followers. 
Uh, I've got 50, almost 53, I think. I don't know. On so 53,000 followers in what, yeah. seven months? Seven months? Uh, it's Eight probably months? like closer to 10 now, maybe 11. Yeah. But, but it's been pretty it's cool. Insane. It's been pretty uh, cool. Hey, look, I guess people like making money. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, <laughs> that's how they follow you. Yeah. My success rate has not fucked it up. That's for sure. And yeah. now even, even on YouTube, I've only really been doing this for like um, a little over 60 days. Yeah, and look at I'm your viewership. 10,700. <laughs> You're getting 12,000 per video, 12,000 per video. It's getting crazy I mean, now. Yeah. Massive, massive, massive. So you, you're going to be at 100,000 no, no time on both platforms. So if you I guys want to get in early before the crowd, this is the time to subscribe to Jesse and also to follow him on X uh, because you're going to be there getting in way before the crowd. And well, hey, man, I want to do this again, too. So we got to make this a thing every once in a while if you want my yeah, yeah, yeah. We should never start a podcast officially because every podcast partner yeah. I started the podcast with I ended up fighting with and, and the, we never speak again. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that'll happen with me. I think we're too honest. I think we're too honest. I think it would be hard because we won't have any like we won't have any underlying stuff to fight about. Yeah, yeah usually it's uh, it's it's that, bro. But yeah, look, we'll do it again for sure. Uh, I'll bring you back. Cool. Uh, we'll talk more. And um, thank you everybody for joining. For some reason, there's still 600 people here. I don't know why you stayed because this is a, went off tracks like 20 minutes ago. <laughs> oh, dude, we're really quick into it. <laughs> yeah, but uh, people did. are still here for some reason. Uh, yeah. Quick shout outs before we go uh, Sudar, uh, Paul, Luke, uh, Murat is always here. Uh, book and tackles. Sorry for anybody that I missed. Uh, um, Fat Chin. I hope I didn't don't get in trouble for saying this. I BJ Ames, Sagig, Kevin, um, LB, um, and of course the one and only Chris, uh, the Chris OG the Chris. Thank you yeah. so much. And Tanner, I don't know if Tanner's still here, but Tanner, thank you for stopping by as well. Thank you everybody. Uh, thank you for spending these uh, ninety minutes with us. It was a blast. Thank you to Jesse. Go follow him. Go subscribe to him. We'll see you in the next one. Peace. All right. Thanks, Tom. See you, bud.